editor of the National Interest, and I'm delighted to have two speakers today. The first is Harry Kazianis, who is both the executive editor of the National Interest magazine and website, and a fellow director of defense studies at the Center for the National Interest. And Harry has written a realist column that is the prime territory in the magazine right in front, an essay on North Korea, which is a counterblast against the notion that we should engage in preemptive or preventive war in North Korea. And I like to rib Harry that he is counseling appeasement. But in fact, if you read the article, he is arguing for a revival of the strategy pursued during the Cold War against the Soviet Union of containment. The objective, of course, being, as Kennan said, to dam up the Soviet Union at every nook and cranny, and eventually that the regime had the seeds of its own demise built into it, and that we would simply have a waiting action. I'll let Harry further explicate his essay. Our second speaker is my good friend, Michael Oslin who has just left the American Enterprise Institute to become a fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's the author of several books on Asia. He continues to write a column for the Wall Street Journal on Asian and American relations. So with that, I will kick it off and allow Harry to explain why we should not go to war with North Korea. Amen. Well, thanks, Jacob, and thanks to, to Dimitri, obviously the center, Paul, and Misha for being on the panel. Uh, the title of my article, uh, I slightly rejigged it for the website, so I, I'll say that right off the bat, is the case for containing North Korea. Now, I wrote the piece for a very simple reason. There, to be quite frank, there's only two broad policy choices when it comes to dealing with Pyongyang's nuclear and long-range missile programs. The first, what the Trump administration broadly is threatening to do, is what I call, or what everybody's calling, the military option. Uh, that seems to be some sort of targeted strike on Ch Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons program, if he does not denuclearize, which the regime has said over and over again it will not do, and is actually enshrined in the North Korean Constitution. The military option can even go all the way to outright full-scale war, which is most likely means regime change, the forced removal of North Korea's somewhere between 12 and 60 nuclear weapons, we don't know how many they have, over 1,000 missiles, chemical weapons, and potentially biological weapons, followed by trillions of dollars of economic reconstruction, rebuilding North Korean society, which would probably take decades, and that's being charitable, and possibly lead to a showdown with another nuclear armed power, China, maybe even Russia. The second option, which is the one I'm actually arguing for in the piece, and it's not appeasement, Jacob, uh, is what we're doing right now, which is broadly, as I would define it, containment. And that means economic, diplomatic, and financial containment, and more broadly, deterrence with potentially some sort of negotiation in the future. In the piece, this is what I'm arguing, as the costs of war, even a limited strike, are just too high and could very well spiral into a conflict with potentially millions of casualties. Now, I admit that's at the extreme end, but it's possible. Now, to be clear, containment's an imperfect policy, but I'm afraid it's the best option that we have right now. The good news when it comes to containment is that we know the Achilles heel of the North Korean system and its power is its rickety economy. That's, that's the Achilles heel, the heel here. Uh, it's worth something like $14 billion. It's small. Obviously, that's before the illegal activities, but it's something like 1,000 times smaller than South Korea's economy. It's one-third the size of Ethiopia's economy. Uh, it's smaller than my home state economy of Rhode Island. So we're talking about a very small economy that can be strangulated. Uh, while we might not have good tools for rolling back North Korea's nuclear missile programs short of war, we can certainly impose enough economic, diplomatic, and financial pain to make any further progress very expensive. Now look, the bottom line is while people in this town continue to say we're almost out of time to deal with North Korea's nuclear weapons programs and missiles, I actually say we're out of time. What we're dealing with today it's really nothing more than a 2017 version of the Sputnik moment we encountered basically 60 years ago. We go through this shock, but we really shouldn't be shocked 
because the technology to build nuclear weapons and, and long-range missiles, they've been out there for decades. This is nothing new. In fact, it's actually old technology. But what shocks us is that obviously North Korea is a horrific regime. It has you know, political prison camps. I think it's actually the only country in the world that has such camps. One of these camps is actually three times si bigger than Washington, D.C. So think about that for a second. That's what shocks us. But just like every other time an adversary of, adversary of the United States has developed nuclear weapons, we've decided on containment as the best strategy, whether we're talking about you know, the Stalinist Soviet Union, whether we're talking about Maoist China, we've always decided on containment. I think that's where we're going to end up again. Now, just for the sake of argument, we need to look in the abyss at what our military options are and why most experts or even casual observers consider really military options lousy options. And really, we'd be opening the ultimate Pandora's box. So very quickly, let us consider just for a moment a targeted strike one in which the goal is to only destroy Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons and accompanying missile launchers. This poses some big obstacles for some very obvious reasons. First, you need to know where the nuclear weapons and missiles are. Now, according to multiple senior Pentagon officials I've spoken to throughout the years, and one just in the last 48 hours on background, they've been very clear, and I'm quoting here exactly, quote, we don't know where all the nuclear weapons and missiles are in North Korea, period. That's a big problem to overcome if you're talking about a military strike. So if you were to launch even the most devastating military strike, building up, for example, large amounts of cruise missile carrying submarines, aircraft carrier battle groups, stealth aircraft, and assuming North Korea did not launch some sort of preemptive strike, seeing such a buildup, there's a very high probability we cannot completely destroy Kim's nukes. You need to know where they are. Second. What if our allies don't agree with that, that, that concept? This is obviously potentially a big roadblock. Keep in mind, if North Korea would respond to such a strike, it would be South Korea and Japan that would take the brunt of that. They would, in most cases, be against a military strike, unless they or US forces were attacked first. And I think that's important. Third, how would Kim Jong-un and the North Korean regime respond? Here's where things, I think, get a little fuzzy, as we don't know how Kim would respond exactly. We can put some ideas out there. I mean, for example, he could launch counterstrikes on Seoul with artillery. He has thousands of artillery tubes pointed at Seoul. Now, we can have an intelligent debate on how effective that artillery would be. There's a lot of good reports and a lot of good research that's been done that say the training with those artillery pieces isn't very good. The ammunition's old and not very reliable. They might not be able to get off a lot of shells before the United States and South Korea forces counterattack. But think about it, just one shell in downtown Seoul, you're, you're going to create a panic there. And that, that would obviously have a tremendous impact. Uh, other things Kim could do, he could attack with his arsenal of cyber soldiers. Many of them are not based in North Korea. A lot of them are actually in India and other countries. That's come out in recent reports. Or he can use whatever nuclear weapons he has left on Seoul, Tokyo. Maybe he takes a shot at a US base in the Asia Pacific, or who knows? Maybe he fires an ICBM at Los Angeles or Seattle. Imagine that. The other thing I think we have to consider here that's very important is how China or Russia would respond. While relations between Beijing and Pyongyang are not exactly warm and fuzzy, these days China does, for obvious reasons, have some big interests in the Korean Peninsula. Chinese officials I've talked to on countless occasions have said they hate the status quo. They don't like Kim Jong-un having nuclear weapons, but would rather see its continuation than a path would then lead us to war. So thinking about all this, and it's obviously I don't like the military option, what would the Trump administration's containment policy actually look like? Well, first of all, I think it's important that we sort of take a step back and you look at the foundations of what that strategy and how it would be created. Because I think there's some things that you have to do in order to have a successful North Korea policy, period. Whether you're going to do containment, whether you're going to do something else, there's some foundational things that you have to put on the table first. So I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to add a little bit to my piece because some things have changed and there's been some incidents. So I just want to tack on a little bit to it. A uh, couple key points. First, now this is kind of boring, but it's, it's, it's extremely important. You have to get the communication strategy right. It's tedious. It, like I said, it's boring. But what we say, how we say it, and how consistently we say it matters. Our allies are watching our actions. Kim Jong-un is watching our actions. Everybody is wondering what our policy is going to be towards North Korea. And what I would argue right now, folks, it's inconsistent. I mean, just for example, 
are we willing to talk to Kim Jong-un or not? The president has said sometimes that we would. Other times he has said he, we wouldn't. That, that's confusing. Are we willing to engage in some sort of diplomacy or not? You had Secretary Tillerson in Beijing making comments that we had some sort of, you know, channel to the North Koreans that didn't necessarily mean actual diplomacy being done, but it looked like a potential opening. A couple hours later, President Trump goes on Twitter and says, I forgot the exact phraseology, but not to bother or something like that. Then a few days later, President Trump says that we might have diplomacy. It's confusing. So if everybody in this room is confused and the media is confused, think about what the North Koreans are thinking. And that's important. Some other things on the communications front. What are our red lines when it comes to North Korea? I mean, for example, what if the North Koreans did some sort of atmospheric test or engaged in some sort of kinetic action? They've done kinetic actions in the past. Where do we stand on these things? Now, I have some ideas of where we stand, but the mixed messages coming out of the administration, I, I think that needs to be tightened up a little bit. And I think we can do that. I think we, we've got some, some tools to do that. The, the next thing I'd offer is it's not helpful to get into verbal wars with Kim Jong-un. Now, you know, there's been some talk about calling him Rocket Man or Little Rocket Man. And look, it's comedic. There, there's, there's a comedic value there, but I think it's unhelpful at this point. You know, veiled threats like saying, we have no choice but to destroy North Korea, it's just unhelpful. And I think it legitimizes the regime. I don't think we gain anything by going into a tit for tat sort of propaganda or, or talking spree with Kim Jong-un. It just, it just doesn't work. Uh, we haven't done it in the past. We don't need to do it in the future. I think it's time to cool down the rhetoric and talk more about policy specifics. Also, if you're going to enact a comprehensive, successful North Korea strategy, you have to have an ambassador in South Korea. That is so important. Uh, Victor Cha, who I know many people on, in this table, they know him well. He's, he's done some amazing work. He's written some great books. He was on the, the George W. Bush NSC. He's actually negotiated with the North Koreans, so he has practical experience. Would be an outstanding choice. If, if he's not available or, or, or doesn't work for whatever reasons, there are other people out there who could do that job, but we, we can't delay this. We need an ambassador in Seoul. That's important. Um, fourth, we need a successful trip to Asia. That's, that's really, really key. Uh, it's going to be about 10 days. It, President Trump is going to Hawaii, Japan, Korea, China, Vietnam, the Philippines. Key, key, key visits. Uh, and it, it, the President needs to go to Asia and really ensure, despite leaving TPP, uh, despite some really tough campaign talk, that we are going to support our allies. It's, it is such an important trip, and it needs to go successfully. Uh, the rhetoric needs to cool down, like I've said. Less tweets, more policy specifics. Very, very important. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to leave this here. In the piece, you can sort of read the ideas I put forward in terms of what the actual containment policy would be. But I, I think we all sort of have the, the broad contours of what that looks like. We've done these things in the past, but just very, very quickly. Um, I think when it comes to North Korea, increasing our missile defense platforms in the region is, is a, good, a really good idea. Now, we all know missile defense is not perfect. There's not a 97 percent um, hit to kill ratio, whatever President Trump said. Um, but, but I think it gives us some options. It gives us a little bit of protection. Keep in mind, the North Koreans have around 1,000 missiles in their arsenal. Not all of them are ICBM. Many of them are short or medium range. Uh, I think missile defense does have an important part to play. Again, imperfect, but part of a comprehensive strategy. I think that's a good idea. Uh, in terms of economic containment, just very quickly, I think one thing that would be a good idea is we really need to push for the ending of what amounts to about $2 billion in money that flows into North Korea it would, in what is essentially slave labor. The North Koreans essentially take their citizens, they send them overseas to, to places in Africa, Europe, Russia, the Middle East, and essentially what they do is they take their, the fruits of their labor and send it back to Kim Jong-un. Money goes right back to North Korea. I think that's something that we can push for that I don't think anybody ha sees any legitimacy in, and either we can end that through a UN Security Council resolution, targeted U.S. sanctions. I think that's something we can do. Lastly, and I'll end it here, the Chinese have to enforce the sanctions. We've had nine different UN Security Council resolutions. The last eight, they enforced them for the first few months. And then when the media and all of us have moved on to something else, they slide off. They can't do this this time. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Now we proceed to Michael Oslin, who will speak both on his article on China and Japan, and I think make a few remarks on North Korea as well. 
Uh, well, Jacob, thank you, uh, Dimitri and Paul, thank you for having me, Harry, uh, and everyone for, for coming out. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I was brought here under slightly false pretenses. I, I thought I was going to talk about, about my article, and, and now I, I, I've been told to, you know, respond to Harry and argue full-throatedly against his policy of quizzling appeasement and that we should be going to war in five minutes, uh, which I'm not going to do, however. Um, what I would like to let me let me start out by uh, since Harry laid out a very eloquent argument, uh, let me um, respond to that and then maybe just briefly talk about <coughs> what I wrote about in the magazine, which was why we should not ignore the Sino-Japanese competition in Asia, which I think is as significant as the U.S. Uh, China competition, if if not in some ways more so. Uh, but obviously, the look we're all here focused on North Korea. I just came back from. Uh, the Bay Area, where you know that's that's the only thing people want to know, which is what are you guys in D.C. going to do about all this? So, it's obviously the topic of of the moment. Um, for the most part, I agree with Harry. Uh, let me let me start off at the top level, which is say I agree that we should not be thinking of preventive war. First of all, I just don't think preventive war is politically palatable in post Iraq United States. I just don't think you can sell it. Uh, we're going to go to war because another nation is testing nukes or testing missiles. It's just it's just not realistic. Uh, that doesn't take into account in, um, uh, stepping over the line, what, if we've ever defined what that line is. But the idea that this is going to be a preventive attack, I think we, we can safely tuck away and say we don't have to worry about that. But if we're talking about the question, ultimately, of dealing with the North Koreans, I guess it's a question of is this an intolerable threat? Can we tolerate the threat of a nuclear North Korea? So I would ask, in the spirit of the Chinese uh, Party Congress, which is which is ongoing. Let me let me give you the five asks, which if we could put it in kanji, it'd be the five asks. The first ask is, what actually has changed? Now, I, I let me say I'm, I'm not going to give answers because I think everyone here probably has answers as good as I do. But I do want to step back and try to give a, maybe a little bit more from my perspective context than uh, the way that that Harry very detailed you know approached a a policy prescription, which I, which I appreciate very much. But the first ask is, what actually has changed? We have lived with the threat of a North Korean uh, potential attack on South Korea for six decades now. Uh, we have lived with the threat of a North Korean missile attack on Japan for probably three decades now. Uh, and now we are at the point of asking, can we live with the threat of attack? Limited, to be sure, but potentially devastating on the U.S. homeland. But if we've already answered that, yes, we can live with the threat of a North Korean attack because we've done nothing about this so far, either as an ally or to protect ourselves, then I think we have to ask the question, does simply having nuclear weapons create a categorically different type of threat? And I'm not, not quite sure we've asked that question or answered it. Maybe we've assumed it, but given the history of how we've approached North Korea, I'm not sure that that has been fully answered. Um, Second, uh, within that, it's very concerning, I think, that the administration continues at the highest levels to talk about denuclearization, complete, verifiable, and irreversible, irreversible uh, denuclearization, not because it's a fantasy, which it is, but because it will simply absorb all the intellectual energies of the administration over the next four years. If that's what your end goal is, that's where you're going to be putting your human resources, your material resources, into trying to achieve. Um, we have failed to engage the North Koreans, to bribe the North Koreans, and even to coerce the North Koreans. The only thing that's left is compulsion. And again, on the assumption that we're not going to compel them to give up their nuclear weapons, certainly in a preventive war, then we have to ask, uh, can we live with them? What I think has changed the most is not the threat of war, it's the threat of accident. And hopefully I'll have something uh, out on this soon. And I don't mean accident that President Trump and Kim Jong-un are going to stumble into a war. I mean a real accident. A missile goes off by itself because they don't have safety protocols. Uh, uh, a nuclear warhead explodes because of poor safety, and the North decides to blame South Korea, Japan, or the United States. Um, a crisis in which we do a show of force, we fly a B-52, and because we don't understand North Korea's command and control procedures, some guy who has launch authority thinks this is the real thing and launches it. The phones go down at the wrong time. Anything. We have no idea what launch authority is going to be, permissive action links, um, authenticated messages, 
Uh, and that's just for the ground-based stuff. Wait until they get uh, SSBNs, which they're trying to do. That's, that's what I think has truly changed, is that we and the, the Russians for 70 years have dealt with the very complicated issue of, a, uh, of, of maintaining a safe and reliable nuclear enterprise. And now we're going to depend on the North Koreans to do the same thing. This could plunge us into a war much more quickly than tweeting about Rocket Man because the inability of the North Koreans to accept that they've made a mistake, that their, their people aren't safe and secure or reliable, uh, that they don't know how they're going to respond if you put into, uh, into action, for example, automatic response mechanisms, that really to me is what has changed. So that raises a couple more questions, and I'll be, I'll be quick on this. Um, the first one is, so again, leaving aside this, this issue of threat of accident, Given how little we know about North Korea, are we confident to any degree that we understand how having a nuclear capability changes Kim Jong-un's decision-making process? Will he become more responsible? Will he become more confident because he feels he has the ultimate deterrent? Or conversely, will he become more reckless because now he feels he has basically top cover to do anything he wants? Where are we in trying even to begin assessing how we think having this capability when he has a full and reliable capability from his perspective, will change the way he acts. That leads into a corollary question. How will North Korea having a nuclear capability affect U.S. decision-making processes? Again, to, to take Harry's point, will we step back and say, this is really, you know, new wine and old bottles, therefore we can pursue containment policy, or is this intolerable, intolerable threat something that we have to have a much shorter uh, leash on, for example, a shorter decision-making process for us to cross a red line. So have we thought through for us what it really means to have a North Korea with, with a nuclear weapon? Those are the first three asks. The fourth ask is, so what's Trump's policy been so far? Uh, right now, I think it's personally, I mean, uh, a lot of you look at it even more carefully than I do. I think it's basically been Obama plus with his inimitable rhetoric and tweeting. But pretty much it's been Obama plus. Number one, denuclearization is the ultimate goal, which is a subheading of we're willing to enter into negotiations. Number two, sanctions. Again, at the UN, and this time unilateral or, or unanimous sanction votes, two of them so far at the UN. Um, three, threats of force, shows of force, same thing the Obama people did. And fourth, a little bit of a twist, you know, being willing to sell the South Koreans and the Japanese more weapons. All of these are good things. But there really hasn't been a significant change other than the potential rhetoric, which, as Harry mentioned, is a mixed message because it's walked back almost as soon as it's put out there. So that leaves us the fifth ask, the hardest one of all, of course, which is what should we do? Um, I'd like to ask this, of course, by asking more questions. Uh, I agree with Harry that containment is the preferred policy. We've been containing North Korea for 60 years. By the way, just a side coda, we assume we've been containing North Korea for 60 years, right? Containment or deterrence, both of them, is only an actual successful policy if you're stopping someone from doing something they wanted to do. And quite <coughs> frankly, we don't know for sure that North Korea wanted to invade South Korea and take it over and launch a complete peninsular war. Certainly, I would say in the past couple of decades, 60s, 70s maybe. But have we really contained and deterred North Korea? I'm not sure. That's a question of if they really wanted to do something, we stopped them from doing it. But even so, I would say that the path we've been on, containment and deterrence, is the correct one. But the question is, can you do it with a nuclear North Korea? Containment and deterrence is not Cold War containment and deterrence. North Korea is not an empire. It doesn't have a worldwide set of allies and armies all around the globe. So you're containing it in different ways. You're trying to prevent its freedom of action abroad, not stop it, as Kennan was talking about, at the particular pressure points. Deterrence is the same thing. That goes back to the Kim Jong-un's decision-making process. Let's just say we've deterred North Korea for the past 60 years. Can we continue to do so when it has the ultimate weapon? And it may see it as a tool rather than as a guarantor. So those, to me, are the, the correct paths, but we're in completely uncharted territory as to whether it will work. And that leads, I agree completely with Harry about the question of missile defense and that we should, this should be a Sputnik moment. I've, I've used the same phraseology, probably a lot of us have, that this should be the best way to take the sting out of his potential barb, which is that he can't use it against us or against our allies. 
Um, I've talked enough, so let me stop there and we can get to China and Japan maybe in some of the questions. Well, that was a, a very comprehensive talk, and, and, but don't be fooled by Michael's um, claim that I brought him here under false pretenses, since uh, he was initially accusing us at the beginning of the lunch of advocating peace in our time. So I, anyway, that was a very supple response. And uh, I will ask a question, but first, Dimitri Symes has a question for our panelists. I think these were two uh, excellent presentations. <coughs> and I actually agree with most of you, and I think there was a lot of common ground, even if you were coming from some <coughs> two somewhat different directions. But when we're talking about containment, I want to be sure that we know exactly what it means. If you are talking about containment of the Soviet <coughs> Union, uh, that obviously was not a choice. That was a necessity. Because, uh, of course, there was a lot of talk about liberation uh, as a, an alternative to containment. Uh, but once uh, the Republicans took over, it became very clear that nobody seriously meant liberation, and there were no credible military options. When I'm saying credible, I don't mean that the costs would be excessive, that uh, on balance it would not be a good idea, that it would be too risky. Nobody just knew how we could liberate the Soviet Union uh, with uh, considerable conventional superiority in Europe, So that's the first difference. In the case of North Korea, it's our choice. We may decide against it, and it probably would be a wise decision, but we have this option. Second big difference, of course, is that the Soviet Empire was basically self-sufficient. By early 1950s, uh, there was very little economic interaction between the Soviet bloc and anybody else, perhaps with a notable exception of China. Uh, and uh, as a result, our economic leverage over the Soviet Union was uh, marginal at best. And they knew how to survive without our help. That's very different from North Korea, right? We have China. And uh, a big question for me is, do the Chinese have enough leverage if they want to? We are not talking about Chinese constraints, Chinese considerations, but if they want to, if they want to, can they uh, put enough pressure on the, uh, the North Korea uh, actually uh, to agree to a lot of things, including possible nuclear disarmament? And the second question is, if the answer to the first question is yes, do we have any kind of leverage over China which would move China in that direction? And I have no answer. It's a genuine question. Harry, why don't you fire away first? Sure, sure. Dimitri, I think what you, you perfectly describe is when it comes to North Korea, a whole bunch of, I guess, what Donald Rumsfeld would call known unknowns. Um, I agree with you in, in terms of containment you know, when we go back and look at containment towards the Soviet Union, you're an expert at this, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue the point. Um, they are vi different types of containment, I agree. Obviously, in the Cold War, we were trying to contain a global Soviet empire, one that had dominance in, in, with the Warsaw Pact in, in, in Europe, in other parts of the world, there's no doubt about it. Um, and I do agree with you that in, in terms of North Korea, you know, we, we have these sort of two options, whether it's a broad military option or containment, and, you know, there, there's a choice there, no doubt about it. I just think that the best choice in terms of looking at all our options is containment. And to be fair, the, it, it will be very different than sort of what we did with the Soviet Union. Um, we live obviously in a very different world in terms of, you know, the, the how the economies are structured, what types of linkages the North Koreans have to the outside world. Um, obviously very, very different. I, in, in terms of, of how you would lay out the containment strategy with North Korea, I think our best option is really to try and isolate them economically as possible. Um, now that isn't going to be easy to do, but when you look at the size and scale of the North Korean economy and how small it is, I think you do have a lot of options there. Um, 
I, I think those are, are certainly our best options. You know, when, when you look at the, you know, the military options as I laid out, you know, for me, you know, liberation is really no choice, to be honest with you. The, in terms of the costs, in terms of the human costs, in terms of the financial costs, they're just too great. Um, but I do think, you know, as, as much as President Obama was sort of trashed for, for using the option of strategic patience, you do get a lot of, of benefit in terms of waiting out the North Koreans. I mean, let's face it, these type of totalitarian regimes, they do not last forever. They, they never have, and I think history proves that. Um, so I think in that respect, time is on our side. So I'll leave it there. Michael, you yeah, want to address the, yeah, well, the just, China conundrum? Uh, well, yeah, a couple, a couple of quick responses. Um, <clears throat> the, the first one, just to pick up on what Harry uh, just said now, it seems to me that strategic patience was an absolutely terrible policy if you thought you had a chance of solving the nuclear North Korean problem, i.e. denuclearization. If we were at a point where we could have, and I don't think we were, but if we thought we were at a point where we actually could have done something to end this threat, then strategic patience was a, was a terrible choice. With a nuclear North Korea, strategic patience might be the best choice. And that gets to this, this broader question. I think it links a little bit back to what Dimitri said. And it gets to this idea of intolerable and tolerable. Um, I think the American people are going to start asking at some point, and we're going to be on the wrong side of this equation, all of us here in this room, are going to be on the wrong side of the equation of saying, tell me why I should risk Omaha for Seoul. Because the only reason I can see that Omaha is targeted is because I'm giving a security guarantee to Seoul. And then they might go a little deeper and say it's a $1.3 trillion economy and so on and so forth. Why do I have to defend Seoul? And then people here, probably us, will respond and say, well, but, but we did this for 40 years in the Cold War. And then immediately we're going to get our heads handed to us because people are going to say, but this isn't the Cold War. And the Pyongyang is not Moscow. The reason we accepted an existential physical threat, which, which North Korea is if it has 12 or 60, 60 North Korean bombs successfully delivered on this country would be an existential threat to the United States. But the reason we accepted that existential threat in the Cold War is because Moscow posed an existential political threat to end our way of life and the Western way of life. And people are going to look at North Korea and say, That's not, they're not going to invade us. They don't want to invade us. They're, not going to, they're probably not even, they don't want to invade Japan. They may not even want to invade South Korea. For the most part, they probably just want to be left alone. Now, that may or may not be right. But the idea of what's tolerable and intolerable, it was tolerable in the Cold War to accept the destruction of human civilization because we were looking at the destruction of our way of life if we didn't defend ourselves. North Korea does not fall into that category. We are all wrapped up in process. I think the political questions are going to outrace us out in the, outside the beltway. And that worries me. That worries me very much. The second thing, and to bring it to China, is our discussions. We always, you know, Dimitri said, what, what can China do? I think the thing that we really have to wonder about what China's going to do is its own plans for ensuring that its buffer state does not disappear because of U.S. action, meaning by the time we have loaded our troops onto the transports and packed up the, the MREs, I think the Chinese are going to be in Pyongyang and will have settled the regime question to their satisfaction. They'll move in fast, uh, they'll move in heavy, and we're still going to be figuring out exactly what we want to do because our 28,500 troops are not designed to go over the border. They're designed to prevent someone else from coming over the border. And if the, South, if the Chinese believe that what we're going to do is remove that buffer state, and make no mistake, they don't like Kim Jong-un, but they really like North Korea, I don't think we're going to have much vote in the matter by the time we even figure out if let's say we have a 91 scenario, do we drive to Baghdad or not? Do we drive to Pyongyang or not? Because we've secured the DMZ, the Chinese are going to be there. Uh, it, I don't mean it's going to be easy necessarily and it's not going to be bloody, but the idea that we're going to have a free hand to sort of adjudicate the future of the peninsula to me seems to dramatically underestimate China's set of interests here. All right, I'm going to follow on <laughs> with a question. Um, and I would note, Michael, actually, we do have people on the website writing exactly what you said which, which part? in our skeptics blog, saying we should just get out. Um, yeah. And we're also running a piece tonight, why Trump is right about North Korea. So we stay in the gamut. Um, my question focuses on the politics. Our two panelists have danced around 
the President Donald Trump, who is currently mired in a war of words with the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee today, who he said couldn't get elected as a dog catcher and who he called incompetent. And my question to you is, is twofold. Given the manifest disarray in the American political system, which has now come, clearly come crashing into not just domestic policy, but also foreign policy. And this isn't even Democrats versus Republicans. This is Republicans versus Republicans. And given that we do have a faction in Washington, which Harry was responding to, that is, that is pushing for war in North Korea, I have two questions. Are we capable of, of even creating a coherent policy towards North Korea? And how likely, if we are, do you assess the, the threat of war, either through deliberate policy or through a accidental triggering of hostilities? All right, so let me take part, I'm gonna go backwards, Jacob. So the actual threat of war, I would put the chances probably at one in three, maybe 25%, somewhere about there. And to, to, to Misha's point, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, United States going in and acting regime change or, or launching some sort of, you know, kinetic strike to take out Kim Jong-un's nuclear missiles. I think it's actually something like this, that, you know, the North Koreans decide in the next couple weeks or months to test another ICBM. Um, they have all the everything set up, they launch the missile, something goes bad, maybe the engine fails, maybe the guidance and telemetry fails, and that missile crash lands in maybe South Korea, Japan, something like that. South Koreans and Japanese responds in some way kinetically. North Korea responds back. I think that's how you get to a war. I don't think it's necessarily some sort of US or allied instigated you know, attack or, or something like that. I think it's the chances of accidental war. I think that's how you get to that 25 or 33% possibility. As for the domestic politics of this, Jacob, I'll be honest, I'm not a, an expert like you on this, so I, I'm not gonna go too far down that road, but you, you do have to admit, some of the, the, the chaos in Washington these days obviously does not lend itself to creating successful foreign policy strategies or outcomes. I think that much is pretty clear. When, you know, the president and, and members of his own party are, are battling one another, you know, you can make intelligent assumptions and, and, and statements on what that means. It obviously does not lend itself to, to any good foreign policy strategies, whether we're talking about North Korea, whether we're talking about Iran, and certainly if, if we're talking about Russia. These things end up becoming politicized and good strategies can't flow out of them. So I'll leave it there. And, and I'll go backwards from Harry. So I'll, I'll take the, the, what Harry just said and then work back. I, again, I, and I agree with Harry, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not a politics guy, so I can't answer in, in, in that way. But uh, I'd ask, again, to ask questions more. Well, first is that at some point, if you go down this road, options are taken out of your hand or they come into play, right? If you move to where you have a war, and I'll address that part in a second, but you have old plans. It's not that you, you know, you get to a point where things sort of start happening because they've been laid out to happen. So there's a coherence because we've been planning about this for, for years. Um, and especially if you stumble into it as opposed to here's, here's a coherent policy that drives me to point A, but I'm knocked off to point B, certain things take over. I guess the question I have on that is can any, and you guys, I mean, Scott will know and Satu will know, you guys will know a lot better than I can or, or have a better sense. Can any, war on the Korean Peninsula be a limited war? Can you have a limited war on the Korean Peninsula? Will, will the North allow you to have a limited war? Can they stand having some type of reverse uh, without going in, or, or is that seen as a political threat that the regime can no longer itself tolerate? So, you know, regardless of what we think we're gonna do, which is take out a few launch pads or this or that, because we haven't done it. We haven't done anything in 60 years, right? Am I wrong? Have we done anything? We haven't done anything in 60 years. We had, we had American servicemen hacked to death with axes and we did nothing. So we've never even tried to strike back in even a limited way. If we did, can you stop it? 
and this isn't Dr. Strange Lovey and escalation ladders and the like. I'm just talking about straight off the North Korean regime. Does any type of action take you to a to a complete war? That'd be the first the first thing. And and on the the threat of the threat of war, um, I agree with Harry. Uh, certainly, I and mean, I tried to say it, I'm really worried about accident. In fact, for those of you, most of you know because you were looking at the, this is what we do, no one else does. You looked at the trajectories of the last two missile launches. They went over Hokkaido, Japan's northernmost island. They went just south of Sapporo. It took six minutes from the launch site, which is right outside of Pyongyang International Airport, to reach Hokkaido. And then in another six minutes, they broke apart over the Pacific Ocean. And that's, that's the latest I've heard. I don't know if that intel has changed, but that they broke apart. So just as Harry said, imagine now the trajectory is just half a degree to the north, and it breaks apart four minutes earlier. Structural failure, which happens to a lot of the missiles. Now you have missile debris raining down on a city of two million people, Japan's fifth largest city, Sapporo. Now you're in a real crisis. However, Japan doesn't actually have kinetic options. We do. So now we're directly on the front line of Tokyo saying, this cannot stand, what are you going to do about it? South Korea does have kinetic options, but Japan doesn't. So that's exactly, I'm, I'm completely with Harry on that, but this is where I think it's really dangerous. I'm not that concerned that he's going to launch against Guam, he may, or in that general area, and I still don't think we're going to do anything unless it lands on Guam itself. If it lands in the waters, I don't think we're doing anything. But this, this missile breaks apart over populated Japanese territory. Either it's the end of the U.S.-Japan alliance, because we do nothing about it, or the Japanese force us into some type of action, which we interpret as limited, but Kim Jong-un says that's war. And he goes, he goes all in, because we just don't know how he thinks. So I don't, I, I don't, I'm not a gambling guy. I don't believe in percentages. I have no idea. That's the whole point about accident. It's a, it's a zero-one proposition. Well, I'm hoping someone out there has something to add to these blood-curdling scenarios. <laughs> Hi, Christian White. Great presentations. Um, it seems like you both have arrived at deterrence of one form or another with some permutations. With that, is there any role uh, for political warfare of some sort? I know Tillerson took human rights seemingly off the table preemptively, saying we don't favor accelerated uh, unification. Uh, we don't favor regime change, which he sort of lumped in together with human rights. I can't remember his exact quote. But, um, you know, as unrealistic as a 1989 moment where people are, Koreans are dancing in the DMZ together like they were dancing on the Berlin Wall, Germans dancing on the Berlin Wall in 89, that seems unrealistic. But a policy or a mechanism to encourage factions in the regime so that there's some sort of long-term transformation away from the Kim dynasty, should that be part of the policy or is that really unrealistic and discredited? Thanks. I'll jump in and, and say that, um, let, me, let me answer your question in a slightly different way, which is to say that right now, if Time Magazine is looking for the, the most effective national leader on earth, it's Kim Jong-un. He's the most successful national leader on earth, as far as I can tell right now, number one. And if you were running for re-election, he'd say, I promised you three things. Number one, I'd stabilize politics by eliminating every potential power center against me. My uncle, my brother-in-law, everyone, and, I've done, and generals, and I've done that. So I've stabilized politics because there's no one who can, that we know of who can run against me. Number two, I said I'd, I'd, I'd stabilize the economy, and as far as we know, he has. It's not gotten better, but it has stabilized. They're allowing pop-up markets. They're allowing a, a sort of you know, quasi-capitalist you know, role inside of, of these informal structures. They're using digital networks and the like. So number two, I've stabilized the economy. And number three, I've bought us respect on the world stage because I'm at the threshold of attaining a three-generation-long dream of nuclear and missile capability as, as the great powers have. So if you're looking for wildly successful national leaders, Kim Jong-un's at the top of the list. Um, so from, from that perspective then to say, what can we do from a, you know, to put political pressure on him, to me that's a black swan thing. Are there dissatisfied individuals? Absolutely. Are there dissatisfied networks? Less likely. Can we identify those networks? Even less likely. Should, have, should we have been for the past 30 years pulsing those, you know, trying to figure out, look for cracks, 
figure out how we can work the seams, of course. But as far as I can tell, we've done very little of that. Even though we know there's underground networks, we know there's the Christian networks, uh, we, we know there are, um, by the way, we, we could probably have used a lot more, in a more sophisticated sense, the North Korean day labor that's been in Japan for decades, you know, as a way to sort of try to figure out. So we haven't done any of that in a meaningful way. So Christian, I agree, we always talk about it, but we're so far behind the eight ball, and now you're dealing with a guy who actually may have stabilized the situation for himself and clamped down that it's even, it's even harder to do. I'm not saying don't do it, it's just, I don't, I don't know where you even begin. Larry Corp. Uh, yeah, I'm Larry Corp from the Center for American Progress. Michael, you mentioned the hacking incident, we didn't do anything. What signal yeah, that, do you that think? That was actual hacking, not like cyber hacking. Yeah. Like axe hacking. <laughs> yes. Okay. Just to be clear. What For signal, the young ones around here. What signal do you think it sent when we didn't do anything about the Pueblo or the shooting down of the EC-121? Did that enter into uh, their uh, thoughts about how to deal with us? You know, I, I have not gone back and looked at what we, what we discovered from that, you know, and it's a great and important historical question. If, if there's institutional memory within the regime, I'm assuming the answer is yes. Is it that Kim Jong-un thinks that we didn't do anything in, against the, because of Pueblo and we didn't do anything in 76 because of the cherry tree hacking? I, I'd say the answer is I, 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 I doubt it. I don't know. But yes, in terms of inculcating a culture in North Korean leadership circles that responds to perceived uh, American interests or stimulus, then I, I, I would just think that yes, of, of course, it's hard, to, it's hard to imagine that they wouldn't have. The problem with that, of course, is that you miscalculate, right? And, and it's, the, it's the red line scenario, which often we don't know what our red line is. We didn't know that 9-11 was a red line. We didn't know that December 7th was a red line, but they were. And so it's their misperception of just how far we're willing to go. And in here, I completely echo what, what Harry said about mixed messages and, and the lack of clarity and how dangerous that is because we don't know, again, do these capabilities make Kim Jong-un more prudent and more responsible or less? We had a question all the way back there. <clears throat> yeah, hi there. Ishan Daru with the Washington Post. Uh, just to touch on, uh, well, this is a question from Michael, I guess, on the basis of his uh, magazine article. Does the election that took place over the weekend, the new mandate that Shinzo Abe has, um, change the calculus in the region so much? I mean, hopefully you can answer this question by also touching on what you've written about in the magazine. Um, and you know, it, while it's unclear what he'll achieve in terms of uh, perhaps augmenting or amending the, the Constitution, if, if some kind of measure does get pushed through, how much of a game changer in the region is it? Yeah, so Abe was won a, a third uh, election. Um, third or fourth, I guess, if you count the first one, I think it's four, right? Anyway, um, but this is the, at least the second time he's called a snap election when everyone thought he was done and he wound up with a bigger or as big a majority. So he's, he's incredibly domestically politically skillful uh, and surprisingly got a lot of traction on precisely the, the type of question that you were asking, which is, it, in a lot of ways, if you looked at what the, like the posters the LDP were putting out, it's, you know, uh, I can continue to defend this country with him sort of looking off in the distance. That was like sort of the big poster. I didn't see all of them. Um, uh, and normally we think that doesn't have a lot of resonance, uh, which is that his, his, his foreign policy is a little bit ahead of the Japanese populace, and so it's a little dangerous for him to be talking about, you know, I'm going to stake this election on, on revising the Constitution, uh, which I also think, by the way, is largely unnecessary, except in a, in a symbolic sense, um, and, uh, and not really talking about the fact that the economy is still, it's, it's been a little bit better, but still relatively sluggish. For the most part, it was a, um, what do they call it, a TINA election? There is no alternative, T-I-N-A, uh, which is true. Uh, the opposition party split into two. He called the election early to take advantage of the fact that the new opposition really hadn't, they weren't even able to field candidates. So. You know, again, politically incredibly, incredibly savvy. Um, polls swing back and forth. Be very slight majorities on both sides of saying, we don't want constitutional revision, we do want constitutional revision. The truth is, it's symbolic at this point. He's made most of the changes already. Uh, the changes have been put into place for collective security, for um, selling weapons abroad, for uh, defense cooperation. There's still a lot of restrictions which even changing the Constitution won't get rid of. But for the most part, it's, it's, to him, it's a really symbolic issue of, of normalizing Japan. 
Uh, I think he will do it, uh, and I think we always say this that it's going to be not his downfall, but it'll be where he really gets, he really winds up with with significant domestic opposition. Yet so far, he's moved Japan very steadily down this road the past five years, and if anything, he has a more secure majority or almost as secure majority as he did before. Now, to the the question you raised about what does it mean in the region. Um, Again, symbolically, it would, be, it would be a great affront to China, it would be an affront to Korea, it would be an affront to a lot of countries. But again, on a symbolic level, they're already getting used to the fact that Japan has made the concrete changes that allows it to be a more active player. Now, some of these countries welcome it. They welcome the defense, uh, the ability of Japan to sell them defensive equipment, uh, to cooperate more, uh, Coast Guard cooperation, Navy cooperation, and the like. Japan's been doing a lot of counterterrorism for a long time. Um, you know, it's just an interesting question. After 70 years, does the cork in the bottle analogy still hold in Asia? Um, for some it does, <coughs> and for others they're far more worried about China and, and worried about North Korea, if indirectly. So that Abe's plans, uh, it just doesn't exercise them as much, but he still has to be careful how he does it, and he still has to garb it. And I'm, I'm not saying he's lying, but he has to garb it in this sort of international, regional norms, cooperative behavior, um, uh, peace and the like, as opposed to saying Japan's just back. That, I think, would very much unsettle people. But they are very realistic about where the threats emanate from, and I don't think they feel it really emanates from Abe and Japan right now. We have a slew of further questions. Paul Saunders first. You know, I'd like Misha to turn you a little bit toward the, the, the topic of your piece, but yeah. perhaps drawing a little bit on the conversation we're having about North Korea. So what conclusions do you think China and Japan are, are drawing from American conduct uh, so far uh, in, in looking at North Korea? And, and how might that uh, shape the way that they interact with one another? Because our, our conduct is also a major factor in both of their calculations. Yeah, I'll be brief. I think there's a difference between disarray and disengagement. The fear of the region on January 20th is that Donald Trump would disengage. I think the fear now is that he's simply in disarray, but, but America's still engaged. They reaffirmed the alliances. If anything, they just put a second aircraft carrier. The Theodore Roosevelt just arrived in Asia uh, just this week or today. Um, so from that perspective, we're doing as much as we did before. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I think it's on uh, North Korea, it's been Obama plus. So the idea that the U.S. was going to wash its hands of this region and walk away from its allies and its commitments has clearly been proved wrong. Um, so from the Japanese perspective, it's, uh, I think it's been welcomed, uh, and certainly Abe has positioned himself to be the closest ally of the U.S., not only in Asia, but if, if not globally. Uh, from China, I think it's probably, it's a lot more complex, right? It's, it's uh, the concern that the administration does swing between accommodation or what seems to be engagement with um, much harder lines, and you never know where they're going to be on any given day, the hopes that the U.S. might disengage from the region have not, have not been proved. And in fact, you know, they've linked together economics with security issues, which most presidents have kept apart. And so there's a lot more concern that, uh, that the pressure on China to behave in certain ways, whether or not they're going to do so, is, is more manifest under, under this under this president. Underlying all of this, and before I you know, turn it over to Harry to, to, to respond on this, underlying all of this is what I tried to write about, which is that the Sino-Japanese competition uh, is, if anything, more heated uh, than ever before. And, it's, and to me, that's really the long-run competition in Asia. Now, we're living through a period where the United States is engaged in Asia. We've been engaged in Asia for, you know, in, at, in this iteration for 70 years. We were engaged for a century before that. Um, but that still is almost nothing compared to the length of time that Japan and China have been battling over influence, if not supremacy, in Asia. And I think that with both of them, uh, China moderately weakening, Japan moderately strengthening, both of them comparatively very strong, that this is really a significant competition that, that we should not dismiss. And it's becoming more sophisticated in different ways. They're using multilateral institutions or creating them. Uh, they are reaching out to new types of uh, uh, security partners and, and cooperation. Japan certainly hadn't been doing that post-war. Um, they're using the bully pulpit, uh, and, and so their competition is actually becoming more sophisticated 
not less sophisticated, uh, because the stakes are seen as so high as to how powerful China can get in sort of setting rules and norms in the region. And that ultimate question of, uh, at least for this era, how long will the United States stay? And they're both maneuvering to ensure uh, that they uh, are not adversely affected from their own perspective by a change in that American position. Harry. Let me just be brief and, and just picking up back off Misha. Um, in terms of, I want to touch on just very quickly on sort of the Chinese perspective. One thing I always try to do in my own writing and research is to try to include that into to what I write and say, because I think it's important. I don't think it really gets enough thrift in some of the things that come out. Um, I have a very, very good friend in Beijing. He's, I would say, a, a semi-famous academic. He's pretty close to the central government. So what I try to do a lot of the time is, is ask him different questions and try to get a sense of what's happening in Beijing. Obviously, it matters. One of the things I was very struck that at least he claims that a lot of Chinese scholars, academics, thinkers, and people in the government was very impressed with was Secretary Tillerson's comments when he came out and said some very powerful things that we weren't looking for regime change. That, I think, was very, very powerful to the Chinese. They accepted this as, you know, that the, that the Trump administration sort of understood the dynamics of what was going on in North Korea, that they weren't going to have a reckless policy, that there wasn't going to be any, any sort of military attack. But as the, the weeks and months sort of went further and further downfield, th this same friend of mine kept saying to me, Harry, I don't understand the Trump policy. Why do they keep saying different things? Why do different things keep getting walked back? Why are they making these sort of reckless statements? Here in Beijing, we're scared. And that's literally what he said. He said, we don't understand sort of the, the policy. So I think from China's perspective is they're, they're worried, they're, they're concerned, they're unsure of where this situation is going to go. And I, I think it's why it's so important that the administration sort of have a uniform sort of communication strategy. Again, like I said, that's boring, that's, that's not very sexy, but I think it's one of the most important things that this administration can do to sort of, you know, allay Chinese fears and allay Japanese fears and South Korean fears. And I think when President Trump goes to Asia, I think it's very, very important that they use this as their opportunity to not only lay out their North Korea strategy, which, I mean, yeah, I would agree, I would agree with Misha broadly, it is Obama plus, I, I wouldn't really quibble with that, but to also lay out what their whole Asia policy is going to be. Keep in mind, we have a lot of other issues on the table here besides North Korea. We're not talking about the South China Sea that much these days, but it's certainly out, in the, out there. Uh, we still have the issue of Taiwan, still very much in play. And poor Misha didn't even get a chance to talk about his, uh, his good information about the East China Sea. I want to hear more about that. Um, but these are all things that I think the administration needs to lay out, and I think they're important. More questions? Right here first. John Glazer with the Cato Institute. Uh, Harry, you mentioned sanctions. Um, my read of the literature on sanctions is that they're a really poor foreign policy tool, and in the rare circumstances in which they work in actually altering the uh, behavior of the target state, it's when you hold out some kind of uh, prospect of sanctions relief given changed behavior. <clears throat> you seem to just want to sanction them until the regime collapses. That hasn't worked out in the past all that well, I don't think. Keeping them weak is one argument for sanctions, but um, it's not constructive towards some end. That's just using sanctions as an end in themselves. So if you could talk to that. <clears throat> to Michael, uh, if it's the case that the foremost uh, threat of North Korea's nuclear weapons is not that they'll use them deliberately or that they'll, uh, it's some kind of inadvertent escalation, but rather an accident, isn't it in our interest and indeed a priority to try to tone down the rhetoric, reach out to them, develop contacts, lines of communication to prevent accidents or deal with them when they uh, happen? And then finally, um, just in, in general, discussions about North Korea uh, obviously place a lot of emphasis on North Korean behavior, provocations, proliferation, et cetera. Um, and you mentioned the domestic political situation here and how that's not all that constructive. But it doesn't begin and end with Trump, right? I think um, I would suggest we have not sufficiently considered the possibility that the United States has been the most detrimental actor 
in this situation, not just with our posture in Northeast Asia, but also Iraq, Libya, you know, the threat threatening to rip up a successful non-proliferation agreement with Iran, et cetera. Thomas Schelling used to say that uh, America's non-proliferation efforts have ironically been a prime driver of proliferation. So, Folks, the rubber has just hit the road. <laughs> John Glazer is very tough. And I love John. Very interested to hear the reaction. John and I had a debate a couple a couple years back, which was, in my opinion, was epic. You should check it out. It was on the National just about, like I said, about two years ago. And actually, John, I like we've said before, I've I've moved in your direction a lot of these things. Let me I'm gonna work backwards again. I agree with you 100. percent And I think where you're going with this is is this whole idea of regime change. Look, let's just put it on the table. Regime change in probably many situations is a really bad idea because you, you never understand. Look, I mean, you have to think about it in a lot of different ways. You're, you're talking about rebuilding societies, rebuilding institutions. And as we found out in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Yugoslavia, that's a really hard thing to do. And that's one of the reasons I'm so against a military option when it comes to North Korea, because if it goes that far down and you end up having to rebuild North Korean society, I mean, think about what we're talking about. And, and I don't think that this is really out there in the media because it doesn't fit into that 30-second soundbite. Um, you're talking about rebuilding a whole society from scratch. My wife's a therapist, and I tried to explain to her the, 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 the magnanimity of, of what we're talking about. And she looked at me and she said, Harry, there's not enough therapists in the world to fix that problem. So I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know really, really where you go with that. Um, just to briefly talk about sanctions really quickly. I'm going to agree with you partially, John. Sanctions are a blunt instrument. They are imperfect. I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, th there's a lot of good research there. My colleague, actually, Paul Saunders, and I have talked about this in a couple different iterations, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you in a lot of the ways. I definitely do not want regime change, regime collapse, or forced regime collapse. I think that would be terrible. That might actually even be worse than a war. But I think if, if we have the ability, again, imperfectly, to ensure that we, we can basically take as much financial resources away from the North Koreans that we know that would go into their nuclear missile programs, I think that would be beneficial. Again, I don't think we can roll those programs back. I don't think we're going to be able to forcibly have the North Koreans come to the table and say, oh, we give up, I give in, I'm, I'm giving you all my nuclear weapons. That's not going to happen. But I do think if we can slow their progress, if we can make it as painful as possible, I think that gives us some tools, so I'll leave it there. Misha, are we the bad boy? Yeah, um, it's a little, it's a little, uh, I appreciate the question, a little blunt. Uh, no, I mean, I don't think that we are, that we are the problem. I mean, there's, there's, you know, these, these run at different levels, right? There's the, the things that you've mentioned, which essentially are tactical. They're big, but in the sense of our approach to the world, they're tactical because the big strategic goal was trying to keep this I don't like I don't like the term world order I don't think there is a world order it's, it's it's a fiction there's no ontological reality that's a world order but it is a set of interests and practices uh and cooperation and the like that has built up over time some of which we we were able to impose at a very specific time but it was our interest in maintaining that uh which for the most part has been far more benign for global interaction than other modes of, uh, just for a quick use of the term, order. So I don't think that, that we've been the problem. Um, what you describe, by the way, so, the, so there, is, there is the approach to how you protect your interests, right? And here's where we get into the, you know, the debate. I assume Walter Russell Mead was the first to come up with the typology. But you were talking about Wilsonianism, essentially, as the problem, right? We're going around trying to recreate the world. Uh, which can a absolutely cause more problems than it, than it solves. But then the other approach is Jacksonianism, where you go out, you slap down the problem that you face, and then you come back home, and you sort of leave, you leave that part of the world to figure out what comes after that. So the idea that we always are a problem when we act in the world because we overact, well, that may have been some of the choices we've made, but it's not inherent in the American role in the world. We can be more Jacksonian. I'm not saying Trump views it that way, but you sort of you, you slap down the whack-a-mole problem that you have at the moment, and you don't sit there and say, 
you know, peace in our time, we're going to recreate um, democracy for everyone. So I think so. I think there is a question of of looking at that big strategic question, and we like the world. Lar we have liked the world largely the way it is. It's been better than the alternatives, um, but some of the tactical choices we've made have have been very difficult and and messy. And so I think we need to be better at the tactical side of it, while maintaining the strategic element. Um, yes, you anticipated in your North Korea question some of what I'm arguing in. in uh, I have two pieces on this nuclear accident. One hopefully will be out this week and uh, let you let you all know about it. But um, you have to think differently. If we're going to live in a world with North Korean nukes, which is I think we will, I think we'll choose to, then you have to ask how do we act differently. And one of those is exactly right. If the biggest threat, you used the word foremost, I think, and I'm, I'm not sure it's the foremost threat, but it is certainly to me perhaps it's certainly equal significance to everything else is this threat of accident. And you have to think what seems to be right now really crazy thoughts, which is how do we help the North Koreans have a safe and secure nuclear arsenal? It's a crazy question, but I don't want my kids sleeping under threat that one of these missiles is going to go off because they don't know, they don't know how, to, how to be a nuclear power. So you're right, we have to start thinking about that very hard. Because if I'm Kim Jong-un, I don't want anyone near these things. I'm not going to let you see them. I'm not, I don't care if you tell me you're going to help me make them safe or best practices or train my people. But that's actually what you have to aim at. And in fact, that's my, that might be the area where we go to the Chinese and we say, and there's something else I've written on this, it'll be out soon, you know, we have to figure out how do we, how do we think about working together to keep the North Koreans safe and secure. And they, and they themselves will, um, will tell you that, that probably they'll say the North Koreans trust us as little as they trust you. So there's not a lot of opportunity there, but you do, have to, you do have to think about it. And then very briefly, finally, on the sanctions point, yeah, if you're in a new world of North Korean nukes, you know, we've approached sanctions as a tool to get the North Koreans back to the negotiating table. And then we've dropped them and we've gotten them at the negotiating table for the most, you know, the really the ones that really bite, like the, um, the Banco Delta Asia. Sanctions should just be punitive now. You want to take this action, it's fine. You know, we're going to sanction you and hopefully it's going to hurt. The problem is that even if we say, look, we want to divide, look, you have nukes, we're not going to denuclearize you, we accept that you have nukes. We're not going to say it that way, but for the most part, that's probably what will happen. Um, but you know what, we're still going to try to stop your illicit activities, we're still going to try to stop you from being a bad actor. The North Koreans are going to link them together because the money they get from the one helps the other. So we might think that we can sort of separate it, i.e., we're not going to threaten this capability of yours. We're going to learn to live with the North Korean nuke. But that doesn't mean we're going to accept everything you do. But the North Koreans may say, no, but they're all interlinked. So if you're actually attacking me on the, the counterfeit money and the illicit drugs and the, the fake medicines and whatever else that they're doing, that's actually affecting my nuclear program. Again, we have to think through that chain of events, too. Does his having nukes completely stymie us in doing anything against him because he's going to link it all together? Or are there areas where we can still, quote unquote, oppose the North Koreans and other areas where we say we're, we're just accepting this reality and we're going to live with it? Those are some of the things I don't think that we've, we've yet thought through because we've been in the mindset that we have to get him back to the table and we have to come up with an agreement. That's what I meant where I think it's very dangerous because that's where all your thinking is going. Your thinking is not how do I answer this threat in a way that secures my interest the most? You're thinking, how do I solve a problem that for all reality and intents and purposes is unsolvable, short of war? Another question back there. Uh, hi, uh, James Gibney from Bloomberg. Thank you very much for doing the panel. Uh, if containment is the uh, preferred strategy does that make the prospect of an independent Japanese or South Korean nuclear capability either more likely or more desirable? Uh, and then uh, just uh, one comment. A great piece in the national interest on, on China-Japan relations. I, I, I was kind of hoping you'd spend a little bit more time talking about how uh, Japan's relations with South Korea and India might affect its relations with China. And then last one brief programmatic note, I just saw that Josh Rogan reports that uh, the president is going to skip the East Asia summit, so I think that reduces the likelihood uh, of a successful trip. Harry. Well, that's, that's disappointing to say the least. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that on that. But um, let me take the, the Korean part of your question, because I've, I've had some interesting conversations with a number of Korean colleagues as well as um, 
somebody I'd say who's mid-level in the, the current South Korean government. For the first time in a long time, I mean, I've, I've done some travel to Korea and, and through East Asia when I was editor of The Diplomat. And a couple years back, going to say 2010, maybe all the way to 2012, there weren't many people that were talking about the actual either redeployment of U.S. nuclear weapons to the Korean Peninsula or taking their own nuclear deterrent on. That was that was pretty much considered a very right-wing position. There's only a couple of people who were saying that. But if you look at the polling data and you look at sort of, I don't know, the, the general ebb and flow of, of what Koreans are saying, that is starting to become more of a majority position. And I, I think that's it's pretty obvious as to why. I mean, the North Koreans' capabilities are growing. They're doing more missile tests. They just did a very successful nuclear test. Um, the Koreans are thinking about it. I, I don't know. I don't think, to be honest with you, that they are going to do that. Um, but we have had some hints about, you know, potentially bringing back U.S. you know nuclear forces to the Korean Peninsula. It was hinted at. It was struck down, I think, by by Secretary Mattis. But um, I never thought we'd be in that world, to be honest with you. So I think it shows how far we've actually gone. I'll leave it there for Misha. Misha. Yeah, I'll just I'll just answer uh, James your point your question on the the Japan um, outreach. I mean Abe has been um, far more nimble in in creating a set of relationships that even a decade ago would have seemed um, unlikely. Now he has not gotten a lot of headway with with South Korea, and of course South Korea has gone through its own political changeover and crisis, and that's that has hindered and played into. Uh, the the Japan Korea relationship, um, you know, the corruption trial of Park Geun Hye and now Moon Jae In, who, being more to the left, is is less likely to be um, to feel closer to Abe. Um, with Modi in India, he's created a very good relationship. Uh, he had a good relationship the first time he was in office back in 06, 07, uh, and picked it up right off the bat. Uh, and Modi came into office what was at 2013, 14, I forget. Um, and the two of them really feel each other as kindred spirits. Um, he's worked hard in Southeast Asia, um, created closer relations uh, with the Philippines, especially where we were falling behind at the end of the Obama administration, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, all of these countries, uh, and Australia as well, even though they didn't get a, a big defense contract they wanted. So in a way, he's, he's been able to um, to diversify Japan's foreign policy portfolio uh, and not become less reliant on the United States, uh, but certainly have um, uh, the confidence to, to pursue a different set of, of relationships and interests. And, and I think this has, in a way, actually helped the U.S.-Japan relationship because it's meant that, uh, that Japan isn't you know, as, as concerned about the state day to day. I mean, they're, obviously, they're very concerned about the alliance. And, and that it remains strong, but they also see that there are other players that they can interact with. Conversely, this has, uh, you know, made it harder to deal with China because China, of course, sees any Japanese action, uh, especially around its periphery, as an attempt to further isolate it. Uh, and if you look carefully, I mean, it's amazing that Xi Jinping is being lauded. Uh, you know, with now we have Xi Jinping thought. I guess you know it's being lauded as the greatest leader since um, since Mao, basically. Uh, but if you look from a foreign policy perspective, he has actually caused frictions with almost all of China's neighbors. There's pressure points all around its periphery, maybe not with Moscow, but uh, with New Delhi, uh, with Southeast Asia, with Australia, um, with Korea, and of course with, with Japan, uh, so that China actually feels, if anything, less certain about, for all the bravado, it actually feels less certain about its standing in Asia, I think, than it has for some time. And that really can be laid in, a, in, a, in no small measure to, to how assertive Xi Jinping has been. So from that perspective, um, every success for Abe is a setback, a setback for China. Now, in, in the old Soviet way, you know, the actual correlation of forces, you know, China still is on the ascendant, and, and no one doubts that. Uh, and Japan has been you know, maybe very modestly ascending, you know, a bit of an uptick in the defense budget and these changes that I mentioned. But that's not a, you know, that's not a material change in terms of how it could actually um, try to contest supremacy with China. But that's where I think Abe has actually been very, very entrepreneurial, all these different types of relations. What he'd really love to get 
is South Korea in the fold. Then you, then you have something that's pretty significant. If you had a Seoul Tokyo axis, so to speak, um, and that was focused on maritime security issues, information sharing, the two of them working together with other partners throughout the region, you know, bringing South Korea into that Japan India relationship or that Japan Australia relationship, that that starts to get somewhat more significant. Um, so China's concern has always been to try to to drive wedges where it can between Japan uh, and those new partners, and it's been it's not that it's needed help to do so, but it's been pretty successful. Um, in feeding the anti-Japanese sensibility in South Korea, and that's really where Abe has not, not made a lot of headway. Uh, but then, of course, they, as I mentioned, they actually try to get beyond that, and they try to get out into, you know, into more global institutions to sort of battle, you know, for hearts and minds. And China comes up with its set of parallel institutions. Japan tries to work through the traditional institutions, and quite frankly, they they both see it, Tokyo and, and Beijing, very much as a zero-sum game. There's just it's not that you're building more cooperation in Asia, it's that one of these two is going to wind up with the balance of forces on its side. Uh, and, and I think they both feel that it's, I, I, and I do believe talking to the, the, the Chinese, as dismissive as they are of the Japanese, they're dismissive because they're worried. You know, you go and you talk and they are extremely dismissive, but underneath that, you get that fear that, yeah, we got to dismiss these guys because they're actually the, the most capable and active in Asia other than us. I'm going to... Oh, I was, do we have more questions? Okay. So you've made mention about the kind of alliance architecture, this Cold War architecture that we have in the region, well, and globally, and how we're in a position where the United States would have to respond on behalf of China in the case, or Japan, excuse me, in one of these accidents. Um, you've talked about extended deterrence, and once people outside the Beltway realize that's the bargain that's been made, there might be a lot of political blowback. Um, is there, do you look at the recent comments from Senator McCain, uh, President Bush, the policy concerns about trying to maintain this architecture, and do you view it so much so that Trump's a threat to it or that it's unsustainable and we actually need kind of fresh thinking and how we approach these problems in the region through increased burden sharing, wealthy allies and the like, something along those lines? Harry? Um, you know, Ed, I, I think one thing that the President has done, I think that's been extremely helpful, is he has questioned the status quo on a lot of these different issues. I mean, you know, for example, the, the Japanese economy, what is it worth, $5 trillion, something like that? They definitely could have a much bigger defense budget. There's no reason why they couldn't respond kinetically if they had to to a North Korean crisis. They choose not to for a whole host of historical reasons, which I think would be its own panel. But I, I, I think that's important. And I do think very broadly the American people are starting to ask these questions. I mean, take the case of the EU, for example. The EU economy is collectively bigger than the United States, but we are still subsidizing their defense. Now, there's very good reasons for that. Um, and I, I think that's those reasons are important. But I think very broadly that Americans have started asking these questions. Now, I don't think it's the reason that Donald Trump was elected, but I do think there is a lot of questioning in these particular areas. Now, what do you do about it? That opens a whole other area of, of, of sort of debate. I think broadly, though, increased burden sharing is a good idea. I think we are starting to see that in NATO a little bit. It seems like a lot of different NATO allies are spending a little bit more. If you notice, Japan is spending a little bit more. Not a huge amount, but a little bit. Uh, the South Koreans and the Japanese are interested in buying more U.S. defense equipment. So I do think there is sort of a, a Trump effect. What I would argue, though, is some of the ways in which Trump has sort of gone about it, you know, the, the tough rhetoric on, on South Korea during the campaign, tough rhetoric towards the Japanese, uh, questioning different trade deals that have been, you know, in place for a long time, it's probably not the best way to go about it. I think the, 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 the most strategic way to go about it is to have maybe some tougher conversations in private. I, I think that's the best way to approach it. But I agree. I think th there has been some evolution in that thinking. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. Misha. I would just say, look, we got what we wanted in Asia, a strong and prosperous Asia and peaceful. But we also got more than we wanted in Asia. Right? So the idea of architecture, again, it's a word that I'm, I'm not as comfortable with, but I understand you know, it's, it's what we say to, to express these patterns of action and relationships we have, uh, this architecture. Um, it was going to change 
over time, I mean, I'm a historian, so to me, you know, everything changes, right? And we, when we got what we wanted, we couldn't expect stasis. Um, the, the problem is that we got those who are dissatisfied with that architecture and that, that, um, that environment and so want to change it in, in deleterious ways as opposed to more cooperative and constructive ways. That's really why I think the question was, it doesn't matter if it's Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or anyone, it was changing. Uh, in ways that would have made it more difficult for us to to manage. I mean, you know, in one way, I know this is really heresy. Satu's going to get up. He's going to walk out when I say this. But, um, you know, we, 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 we pat ourselves on the back about U.S. strategy in Asia. Um, but that strategy was just a gimme for 65 years, right? I mean, honestly, we, we faced really no challenger to our strategy, which means you really didn't need a strategy. Yeah, fine, we bottled up the Soviet nuclear subs and their bastions up in up in the Sea of Okhotsk, that's great. But who else could could have done anything to really change the way that we were pursuing policy? We got a hint of this in the in the late eighties and nineties when we all began to panic, people like George Friedman and others, about the coming war with Japan, because for the first time we saw, whoa, this could be a, a nation that doesn't decide to play by these rules, which should have right away revealed that we didn't have that much of a strategy, right? But of course, the Japan bubble burst, and we we went back to you know complacency and, and and sleeping, sleepwalking, and then China all of a sudden appears, and the first time we have a real credible, no kidding challenger, we flip out, and it's been a jobs program for a lot of us in D.C. for the past decade and a half, which is to say, oh my God, China's going to undo this architecture and these norms and this global order. What do we do about it? Which at least to me indicates that we may not really have had that much of a strategy in, in the first place. So the first time we're, we're really challenged, you know, it, it, to paraphrase, you know, Winston Churchill, you know, uh, we're out of freebies, it's time to think, gentlemen, because we've never really had to think about what are our core interests. Is it a core interest to protect South Korea? Cannot South Korea protect itself? And what are we afraid of? Is it a domino effect? Is it nuclear proliferation? And if it is, can we actually stop it or do we make it worse? Is it actually freedom of navigation? Um, what, what is it that are our interests, how are those interests actually threatened, and what are we really willing to do about it in a changing environment? I'm, I'm just not sure that we've actually been that good at asking questions. We ask all around those questions all the time, but the really core question of can we live in a world that has a nuclear North Korea, has a China that's dominant in the East, Indi uh, the East Asian oceans or what Western Pacific oceans, um, and where the United States plays a minor role, and maybe these 1950-era alliances really shouldn't even be in place anymore. Those are the questions we haven't started to ask. We just take it as an article of faith. Well, that was uh, quite, I think I will pose the final question. Returning, inspired by Christian Witten's earlier query. And Christian, we're very lucky is now associated with the center as a senior fellow in the spirit of full disclosure. That is not your only project. <laughs> Bravo. In the spirit of full disclosure, I did not put him up to his question. <laughs> <laughs> I, chill, chill. In the spirit of genuine intellectual inquiry, he referred earlier to Berliners, East Germans, West Germans dancing on the Berlin Wall. Now, I was just reading a new history of the Cold War, and when you look at that history, you realize just how quickly the Bush administration essentially took Mikhail Gorbachev to the cleaners in the four in the two plus four negotiations and in getting a not only united Germany, but pulling it in wholesale into NATO which was exactly the thing that the Russians said from the outset that they were opposed to. Gorbachev finally completely capitulates at a White House meeting. His advisors go crazy. They start screaming at each other on the White House lawn, but it's over. Now, because he'd become begging for financial aid and he just gave up. So this has to be in the back of the minds of the Chinese. They see Gorbachev imploded the Soviet empire he ended up with the Warsaw Pact, ch huge chunks of it now inside NATO. 
Uh, where is this going to end for the Chinese now? You were referring earlier to the to the idea that the Chinese would move into North Korea if they had to. Where do, you, where do both of you see this ending in 10 years? Because the Chinese clearly are the key players. How does it, what's their objective? How does this end for them? Well, I mean, if, it, if we're thinking about sort of the broad US-China sort of strategic situation where China ends up, I mean, I think it's clear what the Chinese want. They want to be the dominant power in the Asia Pacific. To use the, the Mearsheimer phrase, they want to be the hegemon. Will that actually happen? I don't know, to be honest with you. I think you have to, I mean, I'm not an economist, but I, I, you know, I read what everybody else reads around this table. The Chinese economy structurally has a lot of problems. I think that lends itself to not being able to have the power projection capabilities that they may want to. A couple of years ago, I would have sat at this table and said to you that the Chinese are developing a, a massive global superpower type system and they would, you know, be much more powerful in, in the, the years to come. I'm not as sure of that as I used to be, to be quite honest with you. I think regionally, they will be very dominant. Um, I, I think in the South China Sea, they're getting close to, as Admiral Harris has said, by 2020, they could be the dominant player in the South China Sea. They've done a lot to do that by building fake islands. But I think if you look at the long-term structural problems the Chinese have, for example, local debt, which isn't talked about that much, I think it's something like 260% to GDP. That's a lot of debt. Now, the Chinese have a very different economic system. They've done things to roll that debt over. Um, as we saw two years ago, they have the capability to manipulate their stock markets so they can manipulate losses. But the long-term strategic challenges and economic challenges the, finding the Chinese face are pretty big. So what I would argue, and I wasn't expecting us to talk about this today, but long term, I think what we're actually seeing is sort of the limits of Chinese power. Now, what that means for, for North Korea, what that means for Japan, what that means for the United States, those are, as Misha said, those are, you know, these are big questions that we have to start asking. But I think we need to start asking them. I'll leave it there. Well, I certainly agree with everything Harry said. I mean, I tried to, to address a lot of that in, in um, my book, um, The End of the Asian Century, which, which came out earlier this year, was, you know, counterintuitive in trying to say exactly these, these types of things uh, about China. I think, you know, um, try to differ from Harry slightly on it, uh, though I'm not sure we actually do differ at all. It's, you know, you, you, you have to look at it in a comparative sense. So if the Chinese macroeconomic picture is slowing down and then you can sort of project out what they want to do, what that might cost, can they maintain it? Because you've seen a drop in the defense budget from 10 percent annual growth down to 7.5 this year and who knows where it goes next year and the year after. You know, you can start saying, well, these are the things they want to do, six carrier groups, right? Well, we know how much six carrier groups cost or three carrier groups. Okay, now, now look at what that's going to eat up out of the Chinese military budget uh, and then how they divide that budget between actually what we think of as foreign operations and then domestic operations to paramilitary and crowd control and domestic stuff like that. You know, you can see lots of those restrictions, but you have to put it in a comparative context, meaning they're going to be stronger than any other nation in Asia, right? So by default, they get to do a lot of the things that they want to do simply because no one else in Asia can actually credibly oppose them. The only ones who can at certain points would be the Japanese and then the United States. So it comes down to, to us as much as it comes down to a function of how, of how strong the Chinese will be. But your, but your question, Jacob, I think is exactly it's spot on, right? It's they understand that the Russians, the Soviets, were put into that position only because the system was on the point of collapse. And they learned that lesson right away. They learned it actually before the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, they learned it in Tiananmen and they learned it afterwards so that they would never allow themselves to open up those political floodgates which unleash forces that you can't control. And speaking of which, in what, two weeks? It's going to be the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik takeover uh, in, in post-Tsarist Russia, uh, which is all a story of unleashing social forces and not reading the political moment right. I think the Chinese, as much as they read the end of the Soviet Union, read the end of, of Tsarist Russia and understand how a 300-year-old regime collapsed in three days, right? From the, from the first riots in Petrograd to Nicholas II abdicating was three days. And they, they read that as much as they read Gorbachev, because that was a slow rolling type of thing, except for some of those meetings. So you're looking maybe at peak China today. What I have called uh, the Xi Doctrine, 
uh, is as much about trying to prevent people from taking advantage of, of growing perceptions of a potentially weak China as it is the confidence that China can now do what it wants. Because everyone around the region is looking at, okay, it's 6.9% growth this year, and then maybe it's 6 next year, or whatever it's going to be. Don't try to test us now. That's where I think a lot of the East China Sea, South China Sea things come into play. The, the cracking down on Hong Kong, the cracking down on Tibet, is all about don't think that in five years you're going to be able to get away with more. We're laying the line down now. This is the red line. And don't tempt us by crossing it, because I think the Chinese themselves understand what Harry is alluding to, that the road going forward is going to be a lot more difficult. And they, what they don't want, forget the Soviet Union, they don't want Petrograd 1917. That's what they're really terrified about. Don't say we don't talk about history here. <laughs> On that excellent presentation, thank you, Misha and Harry. Thank you so much.